Great to have you guys here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad you guys got to church okay this morning. Thanks for coming. I know it was tough to, to get here in this weather. My goodness, it was crazy just driving here. So thanks for coming. I appreciate you parking your boats out front. And so I want to say hello to all of our campuses. Thank you for taking the time to get up and come to church today. And I, I, I drove out and I looked up and I was like, really, really? Like this weather was crazy, you know, but it's all good. And so glad you guys are here. The Bible says to preach in season and out of season. So I think that means preach when it's raining too. And so that's what we're going to do. But I'm glad you're here. And I want to just say, first of all, to those who are visiting with us, uh, I just want to say it's a really unique weekend for us because I've taken the time over the last three months to pray 100 hours. And so I've done this uh, several of the times over the course um, of my life, and uh, the last time that really significantly impacted the church where I just said, God, what do, you, what do you want us to do was 20 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, how many of you guys were here 20 years ago when I did that, were a part of the church? Anyone? I'm just curious. Is anybody? A couple people over here? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Quite a, quite a few people. That's great. And so uh, it, it was just an amazing thing. And out of that 100 hours of prayer uh, came the vision God gave us. Uh, as, and that's why we built this building that I'm in, that, that we're in now, the broadcast. That's why um, we have this. Um, all those things happen. And actually, out of that, we planted 100 churches worldwide from the vision that God gave me the last 100 hours. So having said that, it's great. Yeah, God really used that. So I felt the Lord leading me actually a couple of years ago. I felt God's nudging. And honestly, I just resisted it. You ever done that? You ever known God told you something, you just pushed it off? I'm not really proud of that. I'm just telling you the truth because it's a lot of work. And when I mean a lot of work, that sounds bad. You think like, Pastor Billy, you're saying it's a lot of work to talk to God well, it's a lot of work to listen to God, actually, for, for an extended period of time. And, uh, but I will tell you this, that when you do it, um, one of the things that God gave me in my prayer time was that it shifts from your duty to his beauty as you pray. And so that's actually what happened in this time. But I, I'm, today I want to reveal what God showed me after 100 hours of prayer so that we can live in God's purpose as a church, as God's people. And I think that as I reveal this, I believe that God may begin to show you your piece of this. And so I'm excited to be sharing this with you. If you, if you want to look at the notes, by the way, everything I have up here, you can have too on our Church Unlimited app if you want to download that. I'm pretty sure that was not banned by the Apple Store yet. So uh, if you'd like to get that, go ahead and do that. That's a joke. Anyways, uh, but download that and you can have our notes available to you as well. And so I want to talk today about the things that God shared with me. And actually each point that I make is actually one of the hours of prayer. Because what I do is at the end of an hour of prayer, I have a little stopwatch that I, that I wear on my very, very expensive, fancy Walmart edition Timex watch. Anyways, um, and I click it for an hour and I pray. And if I get a little distracted, I'll stop it, kind of refocus and start praying again um, and start back up. And then whenever the timer goes off, it'll be beep goes off. Whatever my dominant thought is at that moment, I write it down. I have a hundred of those thoughts, and, uh, and God oftentimes will give me scripture with them as well. And so many of the points I'm making, in fact, all the points I'm making today are from that. And so uh, if you've got your notes, you can pull those out. Let's say our mission statement together. What are we here to do as a church? We're here to take as many people to heaven as we can before we die, period. That's what we're all about here at Church Unlimited. Again, thanks for being a part of our services. I want to thank all those who are watching online. Also, our God Behind Bars men and women. Let's give them a hand real quick. Thanks for being a part of our services today as well. The second hour of prayer out of 100 hours that God uh, shared with me, he told me this. God wants us to have now faith. The Bible actually says this in Hebrews 11. 1, it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We typically read it like I just read it, but here's another way to read it. Now faith is confidence. In other words, we forget that the word now means that your faith is only really effective in the now. We oftentimes talk about what God did in the past in other people's lives or in our lives. Oh, I remember when God did this and God did that. But you can't have faith for that anymore. That's gone. You really can't have faith for what's going to happen. You can only have faith for today and live in that faith today. And so I really believe God is speaking to you and me to say now is the time to believe. Now is the time to believe that God can do greater things. Is there ever a better critical time in the life of, of our world and our nation that we should need to believe God again, that he can do something great? I mean, don't you think we've already tried to believe in other institutions and people? Possibly you believed in certain uh, you know, people running for office. And, and have you figured out that that's not the answer yet? I mean, clearly we need something greater than ourselves. And our answers, if you look for answers in this world, they're not there. You're going to have to look above and realize that God is still in charge. And the reason why God blesses is if we stay under God, one nation under God. 
Does that make sense? So I just want to start off reminding you of that. That we need the Lord desperately. And I know you have strong opinions like I do about politics and opinions on how we should run our nation. We all have opinions on that. But the truth is, is if all of your dreams came true in that category, we'd still have problems. We need Jesus. 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 Do you hear my heart? I'm telling you the truth. And so we need to call to him because God has some now faith for us. God wants us to have now faith. Hour two, that was spoken to me by God on September 23rd, 2020 in my prayer time. Another thing that God told me in hour 18 is that it's about the harvest and to reach the cities. It's about the harvest. I'm like, Lord, I'm I'm seeking you. I'm asking God, what do you want for us to do? In fact, here's my ultimate prayer. My, my, My beginning prayer with God for this whole season of 100 hours of prayer was this. God, uh, I've been doing this for 22 years, a pastor in the same church. Lord, 20 years from now, I should be approaching retirement, uh, you know, give or take a few years there, right? So I just said, God, in 20 years, when I'm ready to ride off into the sunset, probably on skis, but whenever I ride off into the sunset, right, whenever I'm done, whenever I kind of hang it up and turn the keys over to whoever is going to be next in leadership here, what do you want to have accomplished? And so, and really, the, the, if you want to understand that concept, there's a book I read a long time ago. It's an older book. It's still a good book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the biggest principles it teaches is to begin with the end in mind. Like, what do you want your life to look like at the end of your life? What do you want your kids to say at your funeral? And so start living that way now so that whenever that day does come, you'll be happy. You'll be, you'll be fulfilled knowing I lived my life well. And so my prayer is, God, when I'm done with the leadership mantle you've given me, what would you like to have accomplished 20 years from today. That's been my prayer. And so for the last 100 hours. And the Lord told me early on in hour 18 on November 4th, he told me it's about the harvest to reach the cities. Titus chapter 2 verse, says, verse 10 says, Then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And so God has called us to take his word everywhere to the world. He's called us to do that. And uh, Titus 2.10 says, make it attractive. First of all, how can it not be attractive? It's free heaven. It's salvation. It's Jesus saving our souls. How is that not attractive? you got to work pretty hard to mess that up, to make that look ugly. I mean, that's pretty an amazing gift. And so, But we are called to do that, to draw people into God's house so that they may be saved. You know this really cool thought, by the way? It's, talking about, it's about the harvest. The land that we're on here at the broadcast uh, campus, this land was farmland. And so when we were looking all across the city trying to find a piece of land, I really wanted to find something on, a, on the highway, and so and, and we, we tried to negotiate multiple spots, but there was a new extension of the highway that, that was just being built, uh, that was slavey built, wasn't even fully done yet, and uh, that's where this land is today. And so when we bought this land, I actually uh, knew the guy who owned it. I just happened to meet him casually. He goes to another church, really good guy, and he's a farmer, and uh, he loves the Lord, and he knows what we're about, and he said, I love your vision about what you're trying to do in our city, and so we just made a handshake deal. That's how we bought this land. But what's really a cool thought to me is this land has been his family for generations, and he's farmed it, and generations before that. Here's a cool thought. Nothing's ever been built on this land, which means that when the foundations of the world were put together, God had already slated this piece of dirt to be Church Unlimited. That's the purpose of this dirt. Isn't that cool? Think about that. And so from here, we take the gospel further and broadcast it literally through the Internet and through other ways, other means, um, all over the world. And so it's about the harvest. It's about reaching the cities for Christ. Well, hour 23 and 24, God began to show me some pretty crazy specific things. And then God confirmed them just in downright miraculous ways. But I'm not going to share that yet until next week. So be sure to be here for that portion. Uh, We're going to get into some details of what that's going to look like and, uh, and what God told me in hour 23 specifically. So you may not want to miss next week, I promise you. It will be worth it even if it's raining again. Psalm 60 verse 12 is, our, is the next thing God revealed to me in hour 28. And the verse actually is also the point. The verse is, with God's help, we will do mighty things. And I just want to encourage you. That I believe that one of the reasons why God kept telling me these type of encouragement, encouraging phrases all throughout my prayer time was I think God was conditioning my heart to believe him again. Could it be that the world's beat you down a little bit and you quit believing God for bigger things? I mean, I think 2020 wasn't really a pretty year. 
I think we can admit that a lot of us kind of lost our confidence that we can do some great things when we think, you know, it's almost like you wake up now and you're like, what's going to happen next, right? Rather, rather than tacking the day and saying, God, I believe you for greater things and I want to go out there and do what you've called me to do, it's almost like you wake up and you're like, I'm scared to look at my phone. What, what am I going to see? What's next? And so I want to encourage you instead that God wants to fill you with his confidence. He wants to fill you with his Godfidence. And that's what prayer does is being in his presence. And so he does want and will do mighty things, and he does it through his people. That was hour 28 that God spoke to me on November 13th, 2020. Around hour 48, <clears throat> everything kind of changed. It, 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 I don't know how to say it other than just to tell you what I experienced. Around hour 48, power just began to come over me. I don't know how else to explain it. Have you ever just been in a moment with God and you felt his presence so strong? That was what happened. I was seeking God and I was praying. In fact, I was in my office. And I was praying and the Lord gave me this verse. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9. But watch out, be careful never to forget what you yourself have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. And be sure to pass them on to your children and your grandchildren. Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God on Mount Sinai, where he told me, summon the people before me and I will personally instruct them. Then they will learn to fear me as long as they live. They will teach their children to fear me also. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain. While flames from the mountain shot into the sky, the mountain was shrouded in black clouds and deep darkness. That's what happened when Moses went up the mountain of God. Mount Sinai literally means the mountain of God. Now, the reason mountains in the Bible have always meant a lot to me is because I felt like 20 years ago when I prayed this 100 hours, I felt it was my Moses experience. I'm not saying I'm Moses. I know I'm not. But I felt like I was just in the presence of God when he spoke to me so clearly about planting 100 churches worldwide. And in that, God spoke to me so clearly, I felt his presence. And so I've always considered that my Moses moment, my moment where I went up the mountain to hear from God. And I didn't literally climb a mountain, but I, when you spend 100 hours with God, you feel like you climbed a mountain to be in his presence. And so I've always considered that like the mountain of God where I went and heard from God. If you think about in Deuteronomy chapter 4, when Moses did go up that mountain, what did God give Moses? He gave him the Ten Commandments. What, what's the Ten Commandments? It's when God established the people of Israel and said, now you're the nation of Israel. It was establishing who they are. And I felt like 20 years ago when I went and spent this time in prayer that God was establishing who we are, that we're a people that listen to God, that do his work his way. And from that, we have established who we are as a church. The fourth thing I want to encourage you is this. Go to the mountain of God. He will instruct all the people. And God told me that in hour 49. In hour 48... God told me something. Um, well, I, I, I had a thought, and, um, and I blew it off, honestly. I was in prayer, and I had this thought come to mind, and I said, that, that's, that's crazy. That's not you, God. So then hour 49, God brought me back to the first mountain that God experienced. He reminded me. Notice it says early in that verse, it says, be careful never to forget it's like God was reminding me, remember, you've done this before. You've already climbed the mountain and spoke to me, and I spoke to you. And so God reminded me of that. But I love how it says in the scripture that he says, tell your children and your grandchildren. One of the frustrations about what God did 20 years ago is that my kids were so little, they don't really remember much of it. And so I felt like God was preparing me because I believe this time my kids are older, and I believe that God wants them to see the mountain of God. How many of you guys want your kids to experience God in a fresh way? I want, I want them to be old enough to understand that. So I felt, I felt God's power around hour 48. I, I couldn't explain it. I, can't, I, I, I still don't really have really good words for it other than to explain it as the heaviness of God. There's a word for that uh, that um, Jewish scholars use, by the way. It's called kavod. The weight of God comes on you. And I understand what Kavad feels like. It um, doesn't happen very often. 
I can think of the times this happened maybe once or twice in my life. But I felt that. Hour 48, I had this thought, and I said, it can't be you, God. And then hour 49, I thought of it again, and I thought, that's just stupid. People are going to think I'm crazy. That's, that's, that, that's not you. And then hour 51, um, I felt God front me and tell me, I told you in hour 48, and I told you in hour 49, and I told you in hour 50, and I'll keep telling you until you write it down. And I just said, God, I'm, I, that's insane. I'm, I'm the only one man. I can't do that. But he reminded me who he is. Your goals should not be based upon how big you think you are. They should be based upon how big your God is. So in hour 51, it changed everything for me. And God clearly told me to reach one million souls. And I don't know how to do that. And when God told me that, forgive me if this sounds crazy, I can only tell you my experience. I just felt his presence so heavy, I fell out of my chair. And I just said, God, I don't know what to do. I, I don't have the ability to do this. And I feel like God just told me I know. But I do. God's not looking for your abilities. He's looking for your availability. That's all he needs is your yes. And he can do what only he can do. Deuteronomy 4 verse 48 stopped me cold. And it's a verse I never would have thought much of. And I probably have read it a hundred times and never even thought of it. I'm a big believer in the one-year Bible. I was going to bring mine out today. I forgot it, but it's in, in the back. But my one-year Bible, my journal, is, is how I have all this recorded. And I, I have all those thoughts that after the end of an hour of prayer, I turned it back in my journal. I had written one to a hundred on the pages in the very back. And just, I just every hour I write it down, what my dominant thought is, the verse God gave me for it, if there is one, most of the time there was, and the date. And so today's really isn't a message as much as it's just a a document of what God told me. But Deuteronomy 4, 48 just stopped me cold. It says this, So Israel conquered the entire area from Aurora at the edge of the Arnon Gorge all the way to Mount Sirion, also called Mount Hermon. That's actually the way you say it in the, in the original language is Hermon. Say, say Hermon. Yeah, it sounds kind of funny, I know, right? By the way, I don't know if you caught this or not, but... Um, Hour 48 through 50 happened right after the weekend I asked you to pray for me. So I think your prayers push this over the top. So I really believe that it's, it's, it's all of us praying together. How many of you guys prayed the last few weeks as, a, as we asked you to? Thank you. Many of you did. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and go ahead and say it was my prayer that, that pushed it over the top. Just go ahead and let them know right now. You're the one. You're the one that was spiritual enough. Mountains mean something to me. I told you that, right? So Mount Sinai means the mountain of God. So I began to think, I felt like God stopped me and said, look at that mountain. Everything I'm going to tell you now is going to come from that mountain. I was like, Mount, Mount Hermon? I didn't know what, I thought it was Mount Hermon. I was saying it wrong. I had a theologian that I asked about this correct me. He said, it's not Mount Hermon, it's, man, it's Mount Hermon. I was like, I didn't, he goes, actually, it's Mount Hermon. I was like, I'm obviously saying it wrong. But I, I grabbed some Bible dictionaries, some newer ones I've gotten opened up. They didn't even talk about it. I had to go to a really old, dusty one for some of these scholars that pick every single uh, verse that most of us don't know this, and they pick words that most of us don't know this, and then they tell you exactly what it means. And so I had to find one of those, those old school books to even find this word. Because I was like, okay, God, you're stopping me on this Mount Hermon. What is it? I didn't know that. That Mount Hermon actually means sacred mountain. Sacred means holy or set apart for a specific purpose. And God stopped me here because I felt the Lord telling me, I'm about to show you what your purpose is. The two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you discover why. And I felt the Lord telling me, this is exactly why I placed you here. 
And this is why I had you and Jessica move to Corpus Christi to plant a church. It's for this purpose. And it's in Mount Hermon that God shared with me to reach one million people. Now, let me tell you something I didn't know about Mount Hermon either. Mount Hermon is actually known, scholars know this, and this is where I dug in that old book and found out that scholars tell us that Mount Hermon is actually the mountain where Jesus transfigured. It's the mountain where Jesus revealed his full glory. And that's what I felt like. I felt like I was in the face of Christ and he was showing me his full glory. And that's what threw me to the ground. And I just began to worship him and say, God, what are you trying to tell me? So I kept digging. And I found out that sacred mountain means what you're set apart to do. you got to go to the mountain of God to know what God's called you to do, what he made you for. So let's go to Matthew 17. And this is another thing that really shocked me and I realized, because I thought, well, Moses only went up one mountain. He didn't go up another. And then God told me, yes, he did. He just did it after he died. He appeared with Jesus on Mount Hermon. And so, and I feel like God spoke that to me because he's trying to tell me that the things you're going to be doing are for results that you may not see. It's past me. What we're going to be doing as a church is for the generation after we're long gone. We've got to start thinking generational and get past ourselves. Life is not all about you and your influence and your name. It's about making Christ famous, not you famous. It's about his renown, not our renown. So I began to dig into Matthew 17 where it speaks of of the transfiguration. It says this, six days later Jesus took Peter and and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up high to the mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I love that, by the way, about Peter, because <laughs> he gets it totally wrong, which I feel like Peter most of the time. Anybody else saw that way? He's just like, hey, I'll build you guys some memorials. And Jesus is like, no, that, that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> He's like, no, Peter, that, no, no. And I love how he doesn't even answer that. He's like, kind of looks at him as, it's almost like that Texas, like, bless your heart. You know, like that kind of thing. Like, he's like, you're so off. You know, I love that. Doesn't even answer that. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And the voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son whom brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. I had not caught that verse because I was already on the ground. And because God didn't want me to read it, he wanted me to experience it. Scholars say in that, in that old dusty book I was reading that Mount Hermon has three summits. I was talking to my friend John Chastain who preached here a while back. Um, he's the guy who's the president of the King's University. He really knows the Bible, trust me. He's a PhD. Um, he's been to Israel. He said, I, he said, Bill, I began to tell him this, and he said, I've stood on Mount Hermon. I know I've seen the three summits you're talking about. There are three distinct spots on Mount Hermon. When I fell to the ground in my prayer time, I so strongly heard God say three things to me. Think about this. Peter said, I'll build you three, three memorials. Peter must have seen three very specific spots you could build on, three summits. And as I fell to the ground, I felt God speak to me, and he spoke this to me. And I felt like he told me three things. I felt like God told me, you're going to reach a million souls, and you're going to do it through prayer, evangelism, and church planting. And those are the three things that God has made unique, sacred, set apart of who God wired me to be. In the same way, God has put some unique things about you that only you are good at or only you are called to do. There's certain things about you that are unique to you. And this, we're going to be unpacking for the next two, three weeks how to find those things, by the way. And so if you're in business, we're going to learn to 10x your business. We're going to learn to 10x your influence, your career, your faith, your family, 10x your marriage. And so you don't want to miss the next few weeks. Because once you discover your purpose, it changes how you handle relationships and how you handle business and how you handle investments and how you handle your future. It changes everything. This series is going to change everything. Don't miss it. So as God spoke to me, the three summits of Mount Harmon, for me, my three summits are prayer, 
evangelism and church planting. A number of months ago, actually, the way God spoke it to me, um, I was with Pastor Craig, my mentor, and I was talking about what's going on in our world and how we were shut down. And he said, look, all I know is this, man, you are a prayer warrior and you're an evangelist. And it's like I could hear his voice ringing in my ears when I fell to the ground. And the Lord told me, you, there's three summits. And I felt, I actually felt like I heard Craig say it in my mind, you're a prayer warrior, you're an evangelist. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, and you're a church planter. And you love to plant churches. And so I knew those are the three ways God was going to help us reach one million people. Now, let me tell you about this million. Let's break this down. Can I get, go a little deeper with you guys? Who showed up on the mountain? Moses, Elijah, and of course, Jesus is there with his disciples. Theologians say, and I was digging in this when God spoke this to me, that Moses represents all those who have previously been saved. And so that was when the Lord told me, first of all, inside the million souls are all those people already saved through the 103 churches we've already planted. And all the people that have already been saved at Church Unlimited. That's part of the one million. And that's represented by Moses. And then guess who else is there? Peter, James, and John. The disciples, the current disciples, that was who we are today. Part of the million is who we are today as a church. Who, who accepts Christ this afternoon, this morning in our church, this next week, this year? It's, it's those currently with us. And a third group of people represented by Elijah. You know, Elijah never died. He was just taken to heaven. He represents those future Christians that will receive Christ, that one day will be still on this earth when Christ comes back and he just calls them up to heaven. So part of the million souls is who we've already reached, who we're reaching now, and who we're going to reach. Now, I got a little intimidated by millions. You can imagine, I thought, Lord, that is a crazy big number. I don't know how to do that. I quickly grabbed my phone and I texted uh, Zach White, the guy who just preached last week, by the way. He did a great job for me. Uh, I love Pastor Zach. I texted him. This is a number of months ago, and I just said a quick text. I said, Pastor Zach, how many people have, has your church led to Christ in the last 10 years? And he said, I just had our 10-year anniversary. I know exactly how many. The reason I asked him is because we helped plant this church. And basically, real quickly, he said, roughly 4,000. I was like, you're kidding me. He said, yeah, we reach roughly 400, 400 people a year, get saved in our church. I said, that's amazing. He planted this church on the east side of San Antonio. And uh, I said, you know, Zach, you're moving into a new building this year. They're building a building. And I said, I know for a fact that when you move into a building, you double in size. Every time we built a building, we doubled in size at that campus as soon as we moved into it which means you're going to go from reaching 400 a year to reaching 800 a year. So I just quickly did the math. So the last 10 years, when we planted them 10 years ago, they've reached 4,000 people. The next 10 years, they'll reach 800 people a year at least. So that means 8,000 more people in the next 10 years. And if they just stay consistent with that, conservatively, they'll reach another 800 people a year for the 10 years after that, which means that by the time 20 years from today, that one church that we planted 10 years ago, 30 year, 20 years into the future, that means it will be 30 years old as a church, will have reached 20,000 people. So how do you win a million people to Christ? Plant 50 churches like that church, and you'll reach a million people for Christ in 30 years. Does that make sense? Everybody do the quick math with me? Now you say, that's amazing, let's just plant those churches. Well, the tricky part is not all churches that you plant turn out like that one. It's one of the most successful ones, but we are better at it. And so we are going to plant churches, I think, with, with a lot more, um, we have a lot more knowledge now to know what to look for in a church planter, in a location, how to, how to strategize for that. So that's just one of the components. Another one of those components we're going to be sharing next week was something God shared with me. And you got to come back for that. But I just want to encourage you that it can be done and it will be done. And so our vision as a church, our mission, we say it all the time, is what? To take as many people to heaven as we can before we die, period. So what's our corporate mission now? To take one million people to heaven before we die, period. Now, guys, we're not going to change our mission statement because that's a big number, and it, it seems so daunting for any one person to do it. So for you and me, it's still to take as many as we can. In your life, and your world, take as many people to heaven as you can. But I believe God has given me a mandate. He's clearly spoken to me. And I believe that 20 years from now, as a church, we will have reached... One million souls for Christ. If you believe that what I just shared with you is God's will for Church Unlimited and you are a part of this church, will you stand to your feet? If you will join me in this vision, in this plan to win one million souls for Christ. Guys, I want to, I want to just loud and clear. I'm not looking for glory in all this. I want to make Jesus famous. 
This is not about me and it's not about you. In fact, one of the problems with discovering God's purpose for your life is that we keep asking, God, what do you want me to do? What's your will for me? And God's saying, that's the problem. You still think it's about you. It's about him. And if we'll get out of the way and give him glory and point to him and look to him and do what he leads us to do, if we'll quit being so busy trying to tell God what we want and start asking God, what do you want? then God will speak to us in amazing ways. And he will reveal himself in supernatural ways to all of us. I believe his weighted presence is on us today. I believe God's speaking to all of us. In fact, I just want to say this to you right now. Some of you have dreams and ambitions that you've let the world beat out of you. Maybe you've been through some stuff, you've made some mistakes, you've had some difficulties. And it's easy to forget about those things that God's put on your heart. Well, I'd like to revive that today and tell you that if you'll go to the mountain of God, you'll discover who you are in Christ. And when you do that, you'll get God's power. But then after you get God's power, you get God's permission to do what God has called you to do. And so I want to speak to the dream in you. I want to speak to the ambition in you and tell you that it is of God. God has big things he wants to do, and he will come through for you if you will make it about him. God will get his glory through your life. God wants to use you and I to win this world to Christ. This will happen. I speak it out in Jesus' name because he has told me, and I know exactly what God's called us to do and what we're going to become. I believe you have three summons as well. I don't know what they are. I'm not here to answer that for you. But if you'll stick with us, I think God's going to show you. So one of the things I mentioned was that I've been checking all of this with other godly people. I believe God confirms his will with other people. In fact, next week's message is called Confirmation. I'm not going to give it away, but it's pretty insane what God did to confirm all this. I just, it was downright freaking me out, goosebumps all day, shocked kind of thing, how he confirmed what he told me. More on that next week, but I will just tell you this. I kept checking with other people, and I, there's a handful of people in the church that I went to, and I said, you know, these are godly men that I really trust, and I, and, and I go and ask their advice on things. Uh, there's obviously, a, we have a board of directors as well. I went to them, went to my wife, went to my family. I went and sat with my father. <laughs> that was, that was, I'm just glad he's still alive to hear it. I didn't share this last night, but I I shared it with him, and he just began to weep. 48-year-old man, I still want my father's approval. And there's just something special about your own father, just looking at you saying, that's it. That's it. I share with a, a businessman that's a dear friend of mine here in the church. And I shared it with him and said, what do you think for him to critique it or give me advice back? And he sat there quietly. And he's not this kind of guy. He's a pretty tough guy. He's got a lot of businesses. So he deals with a lot of people, some really sharp, some a little unsavory, to be honest, in his business. And I didn't expect his response. And he looked at me and he said, I'm kind of freaking out, man. He said, this is weird. I feel like God just showed up in this room. I said, he did. And he said, I want to do whatever God's calling me to do. And he said, I want to know what my purpose is. And he called his wife and he called his business partners and said, we need to all pray and know what God's purpose is for our business and our lives as well. See, this isn't just about what I'm telling you what God spoke to me. It's God's trying to speak to you. Can you sense it? Do you sense it? God has a purpose for you, a plan for your life. It's bigger than you way bigger than you. Get in on it. Quit asking God to join you on what you want to do in your life and start joining him on what he wants to do. He's got big things for all of us. Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would we just take a moment to pray? Now that we have a heavenly mandate, a divine call, a clearly spoken word from the Holy Spirit himself on what we are to become and what we are to do on how we are to change lives. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, my first question is for those of you here today, do you know Jesus? Have you received Christ? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever receives him has eternal life. Did you know that? Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. 
Jesus died for your sins and he rose again. Now he waits for you to receive him. You can pray a simple prayer. We're going to pray it together out loud. If you've never received Christ, receive him right now. Pray this prayer with me. Online, pray this prayer with me at all of our campuses. Just say, dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died for me. I believe you paid the price for my sins. And I believe you rose again. Please come in my heart. Forgive me my sins. I repent of my sins. I want to follow you from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name we pray. Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true.